What's up guys, my name is Brandon and today Apple officially released iOS 13.5 and iPadOS 13.5 over a month after the last public release, which was 13.4.1. So in this video, we're going to be covering everything that's new in this update, the features, the changes, the battery life, the performance, bug fixes, and of course, answer the question, should you update? So anyways, taking a look at the size of this update, you can see here on my iPhone 11, it came in at about 418 megabytes coming from iOS 13.5. 4.1. Of course, that size will vary depending on your device and the firmware you're coming from. And as far as iPadOS 13.5, it's a slightly smaller download between three and 400 megabytes, depending on your iPad. And taking a look at the build number for 13.5, you can see there it's 17F75. So that's the exact same build number as the GM release if you are a developer or a public beta tester. So if you did download the GM, you will not be getting this 13.5 download today because you already had it with the GM. It's the exact same build. But anyways, scrolling down to the modem firmware, you can see we do also have an update here to the modem. It's 1.06.00 now. So if you were having any kind of issues with cell connectivity or anything related to the modem, those could be fixed in this update. But now let's go ahead and take a look at what's new in this update. So the first new feature is pretty much the main reason that Apple released iOS 13.5, and that is the COVID-19 contact tracing. So if we go into our settings here and go down to privacy and then to health, You'll see up top here, we have COVID-19 exposure logging, and then down below that we do get a brief explanation of what this does. So it says, when enabled, iPhone can exchange random IDs with other devices using Bluetooth. This enables an app to notify you if you may have been exposed to COVID-19. Exposure logging cannot access any data in or add any data to the health application. And this feature was a project by both Apple and Google. So they both combined to bring us this exposure logging here. Now, if we go ahead and tap into this, you can see here we have the kill switch, which it is disabled by default because you do need an application installed a government regulated application for contact tracing. And as of right now, the time of the recording this, there are no applications available for this, but I will update the description when those applications do come out. It should be pretty soon, I would imagine. And this is where it will show the applications. And then you also have exposure checks right here, and you could also delete the exposure log. Now I know there are some people out there worried about their privacy and you know think that this is gonna track you or something like that. It is very safe and I will explain later on in this video after I go through the other changes in this iOS 13.5 update, I will explain why you should not worry about this feature when it comes to privacy. So stay tuned for that. But anyways, moving on to the next new feature in iOS 13.5, if we go into our settings and then go down to FaceTime, if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see we have a new toggle here, a new section called automatic prominence, and it shows for speaking, and we have an enabled or disabled switch. And it says, during group FaceTime calls, the tile of the person speaking will automatically become larger. So if you don't want that to happen, that is the default action when you talk louder in a group FaceTime, your square gets bigger, your face gets bigger on the screen. But if you don't want that, if you want your square to remain small, like if you're in a pretty small group FaceTime and everybody knows your voice already, you may opt to turn this off. You may not want your square and your whole face to be big on the screen. So you could turn that on or off now in this latest update. Now, another new feature in this update that has to do with your overall health and well-being is if we go into our settings here and go down to health, and then go to medical ID, you can see we have a new section here for share during emergency call. And if we go to edit, we can learn a little bit more about this. I and mean, this is where we can also enable and disable this feature. So basically what this does is send your medical ID to emergency services. So when you have you know emergency SOS turned on and you tap five times fast on the side button, it will basically send your information to them. And if you don't have your medical ID filled out by now, you should definitely go ahead and do that. You can you know, list your allergies and reactions, your medications, your blood type, organ donor, your height, weight, all kinds of vital information that could quite literally save your life. So I would definitely recommend turning this on. And if you click learn more here, it actually shows you a little bit more about this. So it says share during emergency call. When you enable share during emergency call, your iPhone or Apple Watch can automatically share the information from your medical ID with emergency services when you call or text from a supported location. Your photo is not shared. And you can read more about it in terms of the privacy and everything like that as well. But this is a very, very important feature that I think everybody should have enabled and just hope that you never have to rely on it or use it. Also in this update, we got a fix for the text character bug. So this was, I believe, first shown by Philip over at Everything Apple Pro. Basically, when you got this text right here, it would crash your applications. Some people would crash their device and they would have to do a full reboot 
but that has now been fixed in 13.5. So you don't have to worry about that, especially people trolling. A lot of times I got messages on Twitter with that and it would just crash my Twitter app. It was super annoying, but thankfully that has been fixed here in 13.5. Also new in this update is a nice new addition for those of you with Apple Music and who like to post your music to Instagram stories or Facebook stories. So now in iOS 13.5, if you go here and then go to share, you will see we have a new place to share this song and that is for Instagram. If you tap on that, we get a nice story with the cover art and the background, which is dynamic and it's actually moving. So it uses the colors right there. So unfortunately you can't add music to this. If you try to add music, it says you can't because you shared it from another application, but still it's a nice gradient here and it looks really good on the story itself. And you can move it around and make it bigger, whatever you want. And when you post it to your story, you'll see that it actually gives you a link. It actually gives everybody who sees your story a link to that song in Apple Music up top. So I'll wait for this to finish uploading. You can see right there up top, it says play on Apple Music. When you tap on that, you can open it up in Apple Music and it takes you directly to that song. So pretty nice, pretty cool new feature here in this latest update. Another new change in this update has to do with Face ID and wearing a mask. So everybody knows what's going on right now in the world and a lot of people are wearing masks and those with Face ID may have trouble getting into their phone while wearing a mask. But iOS 13.5, fixes that issue somewhat. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this mask on and let me show you guys what happens when I try to pull up Face ID. So I go to swipe up while wearing a mask and you can see there it automatically pulls up the passcode screen. Instead of sitting there thinking about it for a minute and then pulling up the passcode screen, it's instant. It recognizes that you're wearing a mask and it instantly pulls up the keypad there for you to put in your passcode, which is really nice and definitely will save you some time if you wear a mask around. And then as you can see in the release notes here, we do also have a couple of additional fixes here. We have fixes an issue where users may see a black screen when trying to play streaming video from some websites. That's been fixed here in 13.5. And then also the second one right here is an issue I had in 13.4.1, and I talked about this in my last video. Thankfully, this has been fixed. Addresses an issue in the share sheet where suggestions and actions may not load. Now, as for the VPN bug that a lot of people have been asking me about, we do not know if this has been fixed yet. Apple has not publicly said that this has been fixed, so that's kind of concerning because this was a pretty severe bug and vulnerability, but we do not know yet. We're still waiting on Apple to push out the security notes, so I will update the description down below if the VPN bug does end up getting fixed in this update, but as of right now, we don't know whether or not it has been fixed. We haven't heard officially from Apple on this just yet. But again, I will update the description and I will also make a follow-up video on 13.5 later down the road and notify you in that video as well. All right, so now let's address those privacy concerns that some people have when it comes to the new COVID-19 contact tracing feature. So Oliver Hunt over on Twitter describes what actually happens behind the scenes. And this should put you a little bit more at ease if you're one of those people really concerned about your privacy and this whole tracing feature. So let me just quote some of this Twitter thread. So he says this, I've worked through the privacy preserving content contact tracing spec so that you don't have to. Importantly, the term contact here specifically means person you may have come in contact with, not friends or people in your address book. And then he goes on to describe exactly how it works, saying step one is for the device to create a long lived tracing key. This never leaves the device. Then every day the device derives a new daily tracing key and it's derived from the tracing key and the current date. An important note going forward that when we derive one key from another, no one can work out what the original key was. So then the device starts periodically deriving a short lived rolling proximity identifier from the current daily tracing tracing key and the current time interval in that particular day. The spec specifically prohibits ever uploading these keys. The rolling proximity identifier is then broadcast by the Bluetooth radios on your device. This means that when you get near another device, that device receives your current identifier and you receive theirs. Devices record all identifiers they've seen for 14 days. Because proximity identifiers are changing frequently, no one can determine which specific devices were present, cannot track them as they move, and can only know how long they were present beyond the life of that specific identifier. So now everyone has a bunch of identifiers from devices they've been near, but they don't know what devices they were, who they belong to, or even whether they've encountered that device multiple times. 
on its own, this isn't useful, so what do we do with it? Imagine someone gets a positive diagnosis for COVID-19. The user can then elect to make their device report their diagnosis. What this report does is upload only their daily tracing key and date for the days they're considered contagious. The spec calls these diagnosis keys. Now to determine whether or not you may have been exposed, your device periodically downloads a list of reported diagnosis keys. With these diagnosis keys, your device can derive the rolling identifiers that the reported device would have shared with them if you were ever in contact. Your device now runs through the list of derived identifiers created from the downloaded diagnosis keys to see if any of them match an identifier it has received. If it finds a match, it can notify the device user that they may have been in contact with someone carrying COVID-19. And like he also mentions here on Twitter, none of this match data can ever be uploaded. And it also prevents applications from ever using it for any kind of tracking information. So that was a little bit long-winded and very specific and advanced, but I wanted to make sure that you guys understood exactly how this works because it is a little bit confusing, especially if you're one of those people concerned about the privacy of it. All right, so now let's move on to the bugs that are still present in iOS 13.5. So the number one thing that people are probably gonna complain about is the mail. So we do still have mail bugs in iOS 13.5. Some people are having duplicate mail showing up. Some people are having the badges showing the wrong amount of mail. So it'll say like, you know, two on the badge there. And when you open up mail, you'll have no new emails, but then you manually have to refresh and then you see those new emails so kind of like a delay that is still present in 13.5 i don't think we're going to see a fix for that until ios 14 pretty much any of the mail issues i don't think we're going to see resolved until ios 14 unfortunately but those are pretty much the only issues i've had so far on ios 13.5 really nothing else to complain about it's a pretty stable build i've not had any issues with connectivity with bluetooth or wi-fi i know i did have issues on ios 13.4.1 sometimes with streaming to my home pod but that does appear to be fixed here in ios 13.5 so if you were having issues with streaming audio to bluetooth devices like speakers or to your home pod or anything like that that could be fixed here in this update as it has got better for me. Now, as far as performance goes, iOS 13.5 is a pretty solid build for performance. So you can see here, I ran a Geekbench score. We got a 1338 on the single core and a 3472 on the multi-core. So pretty nice improvement over 13.4.1, pretty minor jump, but it is still a jump nonetheless. And it does feel a little bit more stable and just more smooth than iOS 13.4.1 did. And of course we do have those additional bug fixes as well which is going to be a nice improvement over the previous public release, which is 13.4.1. But as far as battery life goes, this is one area where I did not really notice a difference at all going from 13.4.1 to 13.5. 13.5 behaves about the same in terms of battery life. I still get about the same usage every day from all devices I've been using iOS 13.5 on. So I would not expect a big jump in battery life going from 13.4.1 to 13.5. So now should you update to iOS 13.5? And I say, yes, absolutely. I mean, not only do we get all the features I just talked about with the COVID-19 tracing, the face ID being better, we have the sharing songs from Apple Music to Instagram, which is something I do a lot, whereas I used to have to rely on a Siri shortcut, which didn't work all the time, so I really like that. We have the very important feature to share your medical ID when you call emergency services, and just overall bug fixes and better performance on 13.5 compared to 13.4.1. So that should be enough. You're not gonna see a big improvement in terms of battery life or cell connectivity or anything like that, but just the bug fixes and new features alone should be reason enough to go ahead and update. And of course, there are other backend security fixes, I'm sure, as well. And also, as a side note, you should have also received watchOS 6.2.5 yesterday. That was released a day before the final release of iOS 13.5 for some reason, but that is now available on your Apple Watch, and you'll get things like new customizable watch faces for Pride, and things like that. You also get a lot of new features for Saudi Arabia. So you'll get the ECG feature in Saudi Arabia and also irregular heart rhythm notifications are now available in Saudi Arabia. And for those of you confused as to why Apple jumped from iOS 13.4.1 to 13.4.5 beta to 13.5, and I explained this a little bit earlier as well, but it's basically because this version of iOS 13.5 brings Apple's new exposure notification API for the COVID-19 contact tracing. And that new API requires a new SDK. And anytime there's a new SDK, Apple has to bump 
the version number up. So it has to be from 0.4 to 0.5, for example. So that's the main reason it went from 13.4.5 to 13.5. So I just wanted to clear that up one last time in case you missed my previous explanation of that. But yeah, guys, there you have it. That is iOS 13.5, a nice new software update for all iPhones and iPads compatible with iOS 13. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Let me know what your favorite new feature in this update is down in a comment below. You guys know I love interacting with you down there. If you guys enjoyed this video, I would appreciate if you gave it a thumbs up and of course subscribe so you don't miss when the next iOS update gets released and what's new inside of it. But anyways guys, thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon.